I will do it and I'll post it out later. But if you want to have your own recording, I'll just go for it, right? Not going to hurt anybody. So here I am in 11 labs. Now, why I'm showing you this is because in terms of your learning and your studying, I have found it very nice for me, you know, especially maybe it's the end of the day, I'm tired, I want to lie down or I'm going to cook dinner, clean the dishes, whatever. Then I can listen to stuff being read to me and then it just sort of gives me more absorption. You can even ask it to read to you several times. So anyway, I'm saying, please create a chatbot prompt I can share with my class to help them prepare for the C-sharp final exam. Prompt should instruct, instruct their GPT agent to teach basic C-sharp ASP.net learning topics. And then... as per the attached documents. And then pause it, questions to assess and reinforce knowledge. This prompt you were writing should direct their chat GPT to ask a series of questions until user types, user types either continue or stop. Their AI should be directed to drill into areas of needing where they need more instruction. The AI should be directed to be empathetic and encouraging to keep the learner feeling happy and cheerful. Em empathetic and encouraging. Empath. Ethic. Oh, there we go. And encouraging. Generate this chat GPT prompt now. All right, so I'm now going to share this out with you on the uh, Moodle. And in the old days, I mean, meaning basically till last year, even a couple of months ago, you guys had to go out and buy books, right? $180, you know, $80 or $100 textbooks or something. And now the last business in the world I would want to be in right now is um, selling tech, writing or selling textbooks, because now you can get the whole world's whole knowledge directed to you exactly when you need it, how you need it. Interactively, you can hold discussions with your textbooks. So I will now share this out. Ah, here we go. And I will make a little demonstration of using it. 
and then we will carry on with our project. See, here's the thing about AI and ChatGPT. You actually need to understand the core fundamentals of your courses now much more than before. Because before you could just go and grab some code from Stack Overflow and copy and paste it. And somehow maybe by good luck it would work and maybe the professor would give you a good mark. Now the students are using AI, but the professors are also getting more demanding. So you got to use AI to keep up. And you got to know what to ask. You have to be very immersed in the philosophy. That's why people like my daughter, Nikki, getting her PhD in computer science. PhD means doctor of philosophy. You got to really deeply understand the semantic meaning of these concepts at a very foundational and fundamental level to be able to construct a good prompt. All right, let's see if I can now share my prompt out with you. Uh, here we go. There we go. So I'm going to demonstrate this right now, and I'm going to encourage you to take this and use it and just change it as necessary for all of your other courses. If you have any questions about that, let me know. I will now demonstrate using this. Watch me. So I'm going to take this myself. I'm going to go to another ChatGPT session. P. Sigurd. That's who I am over here. P. Sigurd. P. Sigurd. Guys, I got to turn off screen sharing and recording for a couple of seconds. I got to go to my secret list of passwords because I can't remember my passwords. I have too many of them. Hang on just a sec here. Pause recording. I'll be right back. And share my screen. Now I can carry on. All right, guys, watch here. I'm going to make a little demo. So I'm going to paste in my prompt. Now, some people say that studying is boring, which I actually never really got that. I always thought it was very interesting to study and learn new things. However, with ChatGPT as your personal friend, you can, you can have some fun with it, right? So I'm going to say, I value or I enjoy watching Star Trek. Please speak to me and interact with me. So I'm this and you for your chat GPT, you take any character from any TV show, any book, any movie, whatever is, is kind of fun, right? Imagine you, you when we're small children, we have imaginary play friends. So imagine you could talk or be taught by anybody you like. All right. So anyway, I'm going to do that. I enjoy watching Star Trek. Please speak to me and interact with me in the persona of a fierce... You guys don't watch Star Trek, so you don't understand this. But the Klingons were these very warlike beings, warlike federation, warlike uh, race. So please speak and interact in the persona of a Klingon warrior... teaching me to defeat the battles of C-sharp to win glory for the empire.
Ah, young warrior, you're prepared for a great and noble battle in the realm of programming. Your dedication to mastering the techniques of C-sharp honors your house and the Klingon Empire. Today, we will sharpen our blades with knowledge and code, readying for the glorious battle of your final exam. So uh, variables and data types, tell me what are the main data types in C-sharp? How do you declare a variable? So data types... We talked about this from week one. Remember a couple or three weeks ago, I gave you that um, lab worksheet drilling you on every aspect of C-sharp. Do you remember that? It's in Moodle if you can't find it. I would suggest that should be your first studying thing because that takes you right from the beginning right up to objects. Data types include of the data types of our enemies. I'm just going to talk like a Klingon here. Include string int float string. I already said string. Uh, Boolean. We can also make objects which are custom made data types. Batleth? How do you spell Batleth? Batleth is a Klingon sword. Batleth forged in the on the anvil of Duras. You declare variables. by specifying their type and their name. Int A equals three, for example. Just as I will defeat those who face me in battle. Again, I'm playing sort of like a Klingon student in a Klingon school here. You find some role-playing story that makes it happy and fun for you. Now, I'm going to go ahead and guess that a number of the young men in our class might say, you know, speak to me like a very pretty young lady whom I might like to spend time with and, and be all romantic with me. You do you. I don't want to know what's going on with your personal life. I just want to say if you tell the AI to do that, it will do that. Just as I will defeat the enemies of my house. Ah, excellent. You grasp the essence of your weapons, just as a batleth is forged with precision, so too are your data types in C-sharp. The basic types, string, int, float, and boolean, are indeed the arsenal of weapons. And, like the mighty objects crafted in the forges of Konos, common object types in C-sharp allow you to create powerful specialized tools. So anyway, I'm not going to keep going here. I think I've demonstrated what you can do. And I will leave you to ask me any more questions by email if you have questions. All right. Do we have any concerns or questions at any point at this point? I am not seeing any questions. I hope you are as excited as I am about using AI in your personal learning venture. And now let us carry on with our project. So I'm recording. Yeah, I'm recording. Am I? Good. And we're going to keep going. I'm going to close this. I'm going to say Mighty Kalis. I have been summoned by my commanding officer to go into battle. If I return, please carry on my lessons. So I'm basically telling my AI, make a record in this chat session of how far I went and then pick it up here from next time. 
If I return, please resume our lessons from this point. If I give my life in the service of the empire, we will meet again in Stovacor. You guys got to watch Star Trek. It's such an engaging story. Stovo, stove, stove core. Death to the enemies of the Empire. Brave warrior, go forth with strength and honor. Your dedication to the Empire. Anyway, I lost my network here, but uh, you see where I'm going with this. So now let's go and look at our lab. So now I'm going to start by watching the video, which I prepared for you to sort of give you some mental psychological orientation. Are you seeing a theme here? A lot of people think that learning technology is hard because they kind of approach it with the right with the incorrect mindset, which is thinking it belongs to somebody else. Somebody else is forcing me to learn this stuff. It's being done to me. Whereas if you find a way to play with it and gamify it and build your own narrative and your own world story around it, then it will be fun and it'll just make it part of your daily practice. So anyway, let's start by watching this video. Now, I hope that the video will share out over my screen. However, if it does not, you have the Earl. Welcome to our exciting journey into the... And if you cannot hear the audio, please just listen to it on your own station through your own browser. So I will share that link out again. Welcome to our exciting journey into the world of programming. Today, we're going to learn how to build a web app using C-Hash ASP.NET. In the vast realm of coding, these tools are your magic wands, transforming abstract ideas into digital reality. We'll explore the robust framework of ASP.NET, understand the power of C-Hash, and take our first steps in creating a dynamic application. So. Fasten your seatbelts and get ready for a thrilling ride. Imagine stepping into a world where code breathes life into your ideas. That's where we're headed. All of this ASP was generated is a by powerful an AI. Framework for building web apps and C-Hash. I generated this video this morning using NVIDIA.AI. All I did was copy and paste the um, lab description into the AI prompt and it made this. Do you guys see a theme here? So many of the kind of traditional jobs have been replaced by AI. Like 90% of AI influencers are AIs. You, you know that they're not human beings. They're, they're computer generated images. All of this was generated in about 15 minutes. So that's why I want you gentlemen and you ladies to focus yourself on being the people who create the AIs. Because if you think you're going to do a procedural job like truck driver or waitress, <laughs> No, you're not going to. You're not going to get that job. But if you can be somebody who can create the AI systems, then you're going to have a very rich and lucrative job. It's the language that makes the magic happen. Now, you move into your ideas. That's where we're headed. ASP.NET is a powerful framework for building web apps. And C-Hash, it's the language that makes the magic happen. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is ASP.NET? It's a free, open-source framework developed by Microsoft that enables developers to create modern, dynamic web pages. That sounds like a super good final exam question to me. What is ASP? What is .NET? 
what is C sharp? He's calling it C hash because I copied and pasted it into the uh, prompt box. And I guess the AI voice said it was a hash symbol. But those sound like three very good questions. Are you taking notes and writing them down? What is C sharp? What is ASP.NET? What is, sorry, what is ASP? What is .NET? Magic happen. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is ASP.NET? It's a free, open source framework developed by Microsoft that enables developers to create modern, dynamic web pages with ease. It's a tool that handles all the complex details of web development, allowing you to focus on creating your unique app. On the other hand, C-Hash is a versatile, object-oriented programming language also developed by Microsoft. It's the language we use to write our logic, our rules, and our instructions for the app. It's like the director of a play, guiding the actors, or in our case, the elements of our web app, on what to do and when. Together, ASP.NET and C Hash form a dynamic duo, enabling you to craft interactive, powerful web applications. They create robust and dynamic applications. Let's start our project in Visual Studio Code. This powerful editor is going to be our coding canvas. Think of it as a blank slate, ready to be filled with your brilliant ideas. First, click on File, then New Project. A wizard will guide you through the process. Choose ASP.NET Web Application as your project type. Next, name your project. Be creative, but make sure it reflects the purpose of your app. Once you've named your project, Choose a location on your computer to save it. This will be your project's home. Then select Web Application as the template. This will give us a solid foundation to build our web app. Finally, click Create. And just like that, you've created your first web app project. Remember, every great app starts with the first line of code. Now, let's design our app. This is where we transform our idea into a tangible interface that users can interact with. We'll start by creating the structure of our web page. Think of it like building a house. The HTML is our foundation and walls. The CSS is our paint and decor and JavaScript. Well, it's the electricity that powers everything. To start, we'll add two input fields to our HTML. These will serve as the spaces where users can input the numbers they want to calculate. Each input field should have a unique identifier, which we'll use later to retrieve the values. Next, we'll add operation buttons. These are the plus, minus, multiply and divide buttons that users will click to perform calculations. Again, each button should have a unique identifier. Now, let's add a calculate button. When this button is clicked, it will trigger the calculation based on the selected operation and input values. Lastly, we'll add a result field where the output of the calculation will be displayed. Remember, this is just the skeleton of our app. At this stage, it might not look like much, but each line of code is a step towards our fully functioning calculator. It's like crafting a piece of art. It starts rough, but with every stroke, every detail, it starts to take form. Every button press brings us closer to our functioning calculator. With our front end set, it's time to dive into the back end. This is where we put on our developer hats and turn our design into a fully functioning web application using C-Hash. The back end is where our app's brain lives. It's the engine room, the place where all our calculations will be processed. Now, let's move on to the next stage of our app development, crafting the back end. This is where C-Hash steps in to give our app functionality. It's like the puppeteer behind the scenes pulling the strings and making everything work. Our back end will handle the logic for our calculator operations. It will take the numbers from our input fields, perform the calculations, and deliver the result. It's all about taking data, processing it, and returning it in a meaningful way. In the world of C-Hash, we'll create functions for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Each function will take two inputs, perform the operation, and return the result. It's a simple process, but it's the heart of our web app. So grab your developer cap 
and get ready to dive into the logic behind our calculator. With each line of code, we're bringing our app closer to reality. We're not just creating a calculator, we're creating a tool that will help people solve problems. And that's the beauty of back-end development. It's where our inputs come to life. Exciting moment. Let's run our app. After all the hard work, this is where we get to see the fruits of our labor. We've designed the front end, built the back end, and now it's time to bring it all together. So how do we do this? Simple. In Visual Studio Code, we locate the Run button. Click it and watch as the magic unfolds. You'll see your code compile. And if all goes well, a browser window will open, showcasing your web app in all its glory. But we're not done yet. Now comes the testing. Try out different inputs, click the operation buttons, and see if the results match your expectations. This is your chance to check if everything is running smoothly. If there's a bug, don't worry. It's all part of the process. Debug, adjust, and try again. Test it out, experiment, and see your creation in action. You've just taken your first steps into building web applications. Together, we've journeyed through the creation of a project the crafting of a front-end and the intricate workings of a back-end with C-Hash and ASP.NET. We've watched as a simple idea transformed into a live, functioning web application. But this is just the beginning. The vast landscape of programming stretches infinitely before you, filled with countless opportunities. Remember, the world of coding is full of possibilities. Keep exploring, keep coding! We extend our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Brown Bear and the dedicated team at Bear Cave IT Technologies. Their technical encouragement and support have been instrumental in the creation of this video. Their guidance as we delved into the world of C-Hash ASP.NET was invaluable. This journey into code and programming has been an incredible adventure, largely thanks to their expertise. Inspired by the wisdom and guidance of Professor Brown Bear, we encourage you to continue exploring the vast and exciting world of programming. All right, folks, so that is your introduction. And there was a lot of information there. So I hope you go back and watch that multiple other times as necessary. And um, you probably didn't realize it. But one of the things I kind of play around with is um, I, I investigate, I sort of think about different audio tonalities to amplify cognitive function, to sort of make your brain work better. And that background music was something called Hemisync. And Hemisync is a sort of a neural technology in a sense, which amplifies human cognitive function. So I'll, I'll encourage you to go and research more on that by yourself. But that music actually does have some ability to, to kind of amplify your cognition and your thinking. So anyway, if you want more information on that, email me. We'll talk about it later. Not going to use class time for that. So let's get back to work now. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So that tells me that everybody is probably okay so far, right? So let's go and, and make this happen now. Uh, let's go to our lab. And what's the very first thing we're going to do? Well, probably it would be a good idea to start by. Did I lose my meeting? No, we're still here in the meeting. For some reason, my meeting flickered and I thought maybe the meeting died or something, but I see we're all still here. Let me just check the video panel. Yeah, we're all there. Hello. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. So let's, um, let's go back to the lab sheet, which I've lost here somewhere. Uh, where did I put it? Okay, so that's all posted up there. Don't need that anymore. Did I close? Maybe I closed it. I'm just going to go and open it again. I don't know where it is. All right, so you guys have this. It is in your um, it's in your classroom thingy, and we're going to work on this now. All right. So if anybody lost it, if you're like me and you can't find it, 
I will post it out again right there. So step one, I suppose, must be to open Visual Studio Code. Do that now. So start by start by opening ESC and create a project. And that's about it. And then, then follow the instructions. You guys do that. I just have to get something from over here. I'll be back in one sec. Don't go away. So a project, as we know, is just a directory and make a directory. If you need help doing any of this stuff, let me know. But I'm going to go and open code. And I'm going to run it as administrator, and I'm going to set up my project. Here we go. Right, so that's something I was doing the other day. I don't remember what that is, but anyway. Now I'm going to say... File. Open folder, because a folder is a project. And I'll make a new folder. I'll call it C Sharp Calculator Website. Calc. Calc. Site. And I profess all my stuff with lab so it stays together in my in my file system all in one place. All right, it doesn't matter what you call it, makes no difference. So select folder. And now, close the uh, the welcome screen. And now we, we're going to need a terminal, right? So you better go and do view, terminal. And I guess we're all set to go. Now we go to our instructions. And we've done this before, right? We did it at least two, three times before. It's nothing new now. You've actually done all of this before. You've done this entire thing together in class a couple of times. What I'm saying is just chill and don't be stressed about it. So once again, there's my lesson plan. Yeah, so the way I did this is the first half of this is like an overview. And then that's kind of the, the what you're going to do type of thing, right? And I've actually jumped right ahead and given you all the solution code down here. So I don't know that we're going to totally get through all of this in the next hour, because in a couple of minutes, I need to go and take a little break. I just need to go to the washroom and eat up my coffee and stuff. So in a few minutes, we'll take a 10 minute break. But if we do not get through all of it, do the best you can. I will still give you the mark. And if you want, we can even have another sort of office hours Zoom call on Sunday or something. If I get several students expressing an interest in that, then, then we can even, because normally at college, you know, nobody is here today. It's just me by myself. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm good. But uh, the point I'm making is normally at college, we would have office hours. And if anybody wants to, you know, me to look maybe more at their project, or you can also email me specific questions, then, then just let me know. If you ask for that, I'll do it. But if you don't ask for it, then I don't really know what people need. Anyway, point I'm making is we're all going to get through this. So
We have now taken an introduction to C-Sharp and ASP.NET. In fact, we've been doing that since week one. And if you want to uh, go and do more background reading, it's right there. And if you try to do some of these tutorials and you get messed up or you say, well, it's not working, just dump it into an email and then email it to me and I'll answer or I'll even do a Zoom call with you to talk you through it. So there's tons of good resources there you can go and follow. And I encourage you to see there's a nice YouTube just video. Just over two minutes. I'm going to show you how I create. I mean, it's not my YouTube video, but even though it wasn't made by me, I'm going to be a nice person and say it's still pretty good. See tons of resources out there you can go and follow. Uh, basic structure and syntax of C Sharp. That was your lab, I think, three weeks ago or something. I'll just link it out again there as a final exam study resource. It's in, all this stuff is in Moodle Law. Or did I even call that your assignment too? Did I? Today's worksheet. Yeah. So that was even your assignment too. So if you need to go through that again to study, then go and do that. I don't want to copy it. I want to share it. Share, share, share. Right. So here's your best final exam study resource in my opinion just go through all those code drills god there's a lot of noise out there they're doing some construction in a sense i'm glad you guys aren't here in the class because all the noise is quite distracting uh... anyway bottom line is that all of the basic how to structure a program thing are right there Introduction to Visual Studio. Actually, we're using Visual Studio Code. The cross-platform works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. IDE. Yay. And uh, Visual Studio Code is good for tons of other stuff as well. I do everything in it. SQL, Python for AI. You name it, I do it there. JSON, JavaScript, HTML, web applications, Node.js, API servers. And if you want more learning resources, you see those numbers right there. Just go and open that and you can go and read more information there. In fact, here is somebody else doing a calculator. That's not my lab. I made my own lab, but I guess that's basically the same thing as well. Now here they're showing it to you in Visual Studio but it doesn't change the fact that the code is all the same. If you want to go and see their version of it, go and see it. So anyway, that was our intro. Now let's proceed with our doing part. So creating an ASP.NET project. Once again, you have some links, understanding the structure, creating a simple web page. And how we're going to do that is down here. So now let's go down together. Part one, part two, part three. Hang on. Here's part three. There's part two. Each part has multiple steps, of course. And part one. All right, so part one done. Not going to say anything else about it. Now we're right here. So once again, this is in the second half, the lower half of your lab document. So setting up a new ASP.NET project, open Visual Studio Code, done. Open Terminal, done. Create new project, as so. And I'm assuming by now, nobody will have any problems with this. If you do have any problems, there is a link in your Google Classroom uh, if, if this doesn't work, it's for one reason only, which you have not set up .NET Framework in your operating system. 
Uh, you can just ask me, right? Just send me an email or even right now because I want everybody to do this together. So let's copy that whole line. So just select, right click, copy, go to your Visual Studio Code terminal. You terminal. Where's my terminal? <laughs> Oh, it's hiding down here. I didn't see it because of this video thing. Let's try again. View open terminal. Did this update something that's behaving strangely here? This is not proper. Uh, let's try again. I see. I think because I had to reload some of my extensions. So it was sort of just hanging because it was waiting. It was forcing me to do the reload. All right, now maybe that'll be done. So let's put this away. Go back to Explorer. And fail to initiate application insights. I don't care about that. I don't even know what that is. View terminal. All right, guys. So I have now got my terminal. Uh, you close the terminal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Iqbal, for catching me into that. I appreciate it. Because here, I don't know, somehow when you're running a class with all these display controls open, it gets confusing. But if you see something I'm missing, by all means, just jump in there, open up your mic and tell me or type in the chat box. Anyway, one way or another, as Iqbal, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, by the way, did, did point out, we now have it open. And that does all the stuff that you can do in any standard command shell like a, a terminal right command terminal and if you go over here now we'll see that we don't have anything there yet because we haven't made anything yet so now let's go and make our project so let's go and do that so go to the next step of your lab we've made our app this command creates a new asp.net core web app with the name Calculator web app, open the project. So now let's go into this um, subdirectory, calculator web app. Oh, maybe I didn't uh, run my command. I don't think I did because I was wondering where my skeleton was. Anyway, if you're not sure, just run it again. Won't hurt anybody. Oh, I, yeah, because I was trying to look for my terminal and not finding it. So I, I skipped that step. So if you did not yet do that, then just go into your project directory and do that now. So paste that in, enter. Yeah. See, that's what I was looking for before and not seeing. That structure of files, that skeleton, is what's set up by the command to create the app, right? So that's what you got to do. So you run this command right there. And... Uh, this command, new web app dash n, whatever name you choose to give it, will now evoke all of this stuff into existence, right? It'll zap that stuff into existence. So let's move on to our next step. So examine the project files. Let's look at program startup. Now app settings.json. JSON we talked about a while ago. JavaScript object notation files. Has nothing to do with JavaScript, but that's just what they call it. R. JSON is a um 
data description language, just like HTML is a page description language. And I think of a JSON file as being like a box into which I can put some data for safekeeping. Now, in this case, this JSON file, appsettings.json, is a configuration file for our application. So the OBJ files, those are files. Well, here, here we have JSON um, configuration, but when we run our app, we will see some executable intermediate programming language files. They're from source, see so you go from source code to objects and then to executable. So the objects are configuration files created as part of the compile link execute cycle of C sharp. You guys might be more familiar with Java and Python because that's where we get new students going on these days. So those are interpreted languages. They go directly from source code to executable format. You run as, an, uh, as a process in the operating system, whereas with a compile language, and I hope you read my article, which I asked you to read on week two, it talks about why strongly object oriented well actually that's not true anymore because of java but in general um actually no in java we do do it as well java we parse over the source code and we make a bytecode class file and then we execute the class file so python you don't do that python you just interpret and run your source code just like in javascript that's why python and javascript being fourth generation languages cannot have strong types. To have a strongly typed language like C-sharp or Java, you must do a two-phase pass. So the first phase, the, um, the language server, Java compile or C-sharp compile here, makes what's called a linker file. And then in the second pass, the compiler goes over the linker file and it makes references to the uh, types in your program code and it creates objects from them. Anyway, all of that's what's going, going to happen in that object directory. Pages, now pages of course are going to be our stuff, which is shown to the user. And that is the main one, index. Now normally that would be index.html, but because we are in C-sharp land here, it is index.cs for C-sharp HTML. And if you want to put some static code in there, Right now you're seeing annotations and markers. So at page, at model, right? Anything which starts with an app symbol is um, a tension grabbing mechanism, right? It's a, it's a way of the, um, the program code grabbing the runtime environment, the C-sharp ASP runtime environment to say, replace me that string tokenization, replace that symbol with the entire content of the page. However, you can also put static code in here. So I'll just put in something like, hello class. This is our main landing page. And then that'll show up there in the middle of all this automatically generated content. So that actually you see there, because that page has the at symbol in front of it. That is the thing that is gonna be string token substituted into that marker in the index.html file, which is the first main thing that gets called to run. So anyway, they just asked us to go and take a look at some of the um, files that are here. We've now done that. And there's CSS, which as the narrator of the video told us is decorator. It's like the paint wallpaper, you know, the finishings of the house and the JavaScript is like the internet signal, the electrical wiring that sort of I'm not going to go into that because we have enough other things to do here. If you want to know about JavaScript, let me know. I have some good labs on it. So anyway, let's go and resume our lab now.
So we've examined our project files, good. We've seen that JSON holds configuration data because it's a data kind of a thing. Uh, www root is a folder containing static files for JavaScript, CSS, images, pages. So the pages folder contains Razor pages. Razor is a .NET library framework that lets us put web pages on our web server where the content can be dynamically updated by the server. If you've done anything with Java Enterprise Edition, then you'll understand that that's very similar to Enterprise Java Beans and Java Server Pages. And if you haven't, doesn't matter. We were assuming no previous knowledge here. So understanding Razor pages, so index.cs HTML, which we just looked at, is the default Razor page acting as the home center page when somebody goes to your web server, which is just localhost, which is the TCP address of your laptop, then it's, it's going to be landing on that page initially. Underscore layout. .cs HTML. This is the shared layout page that presents. That just basically provides um, a template of appearance for your pages, right? Because this is like a template-driven web approach. Underscore view start. .cs HTML runs before, so it's like it has a life cycle. So it runs before rendering each view. It can be used to specify the layout page for the views. And we'll talk about views later on. Examine the dependencies in the Solution Explorer. You can see the dependencies your project has. This includes the .NET Core libraries and any NuGet. So NuGet is um, a packaging mechanism. If you wanted, for example, to get um, SQLite as a database, you would use NuGet in your terminal window and NuGet would show you the NuGet repository maintained by Microsoft for ASP. And then you'd find whatever you want, like SQLite, and you would install it in your environment. I don't think NuGet's on the course outline, so I'm not going to talk about it. ASP.NET model view controller. The model view controller is one formulation of an architecture for websites and razor pages are another architecture. If you're working with MVC, the structure will include controllers and views instead of pages. The controllers handle the application logic and the views are the templates for the user interface. Building and running the app, you can build and run this application to see the default template in action. And in a few minutes, we're gonna, well, actually we can do it right now, I suppose because we do have a template there, it just hasn't been customized with the thing we want. So we'll type .NET build and .NET run. Let's go do that now, .NET build. .NET build. So I typed it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so if there's no space there. In the old days, pre-version six, those a uh, dot was the command and net was an argument, but now it's one thing. One one command. So remember what I said before our discussion about how in a compiled language, such as the C family of languages, source code is turned into executable in a two-phase pass. In the first phase, we construct our linker files, which are the object directory. And then in the second phase, the linker files are compiled into your .exe executable files. If you're on Windows, if you're on Linux or Mac, then they have slight variations, but the process is still the same. All right, all done, no errors. Now we have not entered our own code yet. This is just the template, which we're getting from the um, create project command. So <laughs> it would be very strange if there were errors because we haven't done anything yet. Now let's run it by typing .NET run, .NET, .NET run. Couldn't find the, oh, you know why? In fact, a student had this exact thing in class a couple of weeks ago. 
I might not be in the right subdirectory. Yeah. See, because when I ran the build process, it then pre and this I remember at least two or three students had this exact problem or this exact occurrence. So let's go and fix everybody now. Let's close everything to make sure it's saved, by the way. And So I'm in my project directory, which I called it lab C sharp calculator website. But I now have a subdirectory which just came into existence when I did my build process, which is called calculator web app right there. So that's my project directory there. And that, that, that's where I started writing my source code. And this guy right there, he or maybe she, we don't want to be gender exclusive. She was created when we ran the run command. Very good. So now in that directory, so now you go and do CD, calculator, calc. so now i'm in that directory and now i'm seeing all of my project files right there and now i go to the next step of my lab instruction which is dot net run so go and do that Building, building, building. Good, building without any errors. And now once that's done, you can go to localhost and you need to go to whatever is the port that your operating system gave to our application to serve itself up on. So, yeah, 5,000 by default. So everybody fire up your favorite browser. I'm going to use Microsoft which usually I don't like too much, but we're using a Microsoft technology stack and I don't know, it probably works slightly better. Apparently Microsoft has bastardized, it's made some modifications to the HTTP protocol. And for that reason, their web servers, their web services run best, better on internet, i.e. But just use Safari, use whatever you got. Can't really, I can't read. Oh, maybe I didn't start it yet. Hang on. Build it. Oh, it hasn't finished building yet, I think. All right, guys, I need to go to the washroom and I need to heat up my coffee. So I'm going to be back in three minutes. It's not a break. You know, we're going to go for another 25 minutes, roughly. We'll end up the class a few minutes early. If you need to go and do something, go, but come back quickly because I want to get through this. I'm just going to be gone for two minutes here.
All right, guys, let's get back to work here. Let's see, it should be up there serving now. Let's find out. Content root path, I suppose. I'm not getting an error message. Uh, why isn't it serving? Interesting. All right, first of all, I'm going to run netstat. And I don't think I've gone over this with you because of limitations of time and so on. But there is a tool called netstat that can let you see what's going on on your operating system. And if you want me to show you how to work with that, send me an email. I'll send out a video. I'm not going to take time during class. But I'm going to go to my XAMPP control panel right here. XAMPP is something you get when you install Apache web server. Just go to the apachefriends.org website, install XAMPP, and then one of the things you get in the control panel is Netstat. So what's happening on, if anything, I guess nothing is running on port 5000, because that would account for the problem we have. Nothing is running. Oh, oh look, look. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? Calculator web app right there, in my case, is running on port 5021. So maybe you do need Netstat to find out where your thing is. So, uh, well, if we need it, we need it. I'll spend a couple of seconds showing it to you. But here's one tool you can use to find out. And there's other... Uh, there's other Netstat tools out there as well. I don't know. I just kind of like it because it's it's pretty fast and it gets the job done. So there is where my calculator web app process is running. First of all, I'm going to go to port 5021, and then I will demonstrate how to install XAMPP because it's possible so some other students may have the same issue as well, and then we'll carry on. Anyway, we've got another half an hour, which should be good. So here's my port where it's it's going on. I'm on port 5021. Sir, I can I I think you can directly see in the terminal, sir. It's showing the oh, it does terminal. say, it does say. Very good. Maybe I just missed it. Thank you. Uh yeah, sir. Here you well, can it see doesn't it. say, oh, yeah. does it say it where? Because normally yeah. Yeah, sir. Uh, below the, sure. yeah, now listening on HTTP localhost 5021. You see the localhost, the port number it's running on the web. Yeah, yes, sir. Very good. Yeah, so you guys can go that. So thank you for catching that. Now, if anybody um does want to see how to use Netstat, very good. Thank Sorry, I'm not sure who gave, who got me fixed up there. Right there. Right there. Good. But if you do want to see Netstat, then uh, I don't know why, just for today, maybe because of the weather or something. I have a little bit of brain fuzz or something. So I appreciate you catching me on that. And if anybody wants to see the net stat, Thank tool, you, I will, I will kick out a video, just yeah, email me and I'll, I'll send you instructions on that. But again, not going to take time right now, but thanks for the assist on that. And let's carry on with our work. So I'll drop this anyway into our, into our lab sheet. So if anybody gets that problem, they'll be able to fix that. Jesus, that's so irritating. Every time I go over there, that video, the, the meeting thing pops up in my way. All right, so, yeah, there, which corresponds to there. Great, now we can carry on. Now, believe it or not, it, it's only going to take about 15 or 20 minutes to finish the uh, project from here. All you need to do, I've given you all the code, just copy and paste it and then rebuild, rerun. And if you get any questions, right, you can just email me, but there's not really much to it after this. So let's update your lab instructions with this screenshot. Yay. So that is a basic, 
And that's the thing I added, right? That was just my little thing to show you that you can change whatever's in the index.cs. But all you got to do now is take the code, and it's just one file, by the way. In a more complex app, we could have several um, HTMLs, and we could have some maybe JavaScript, or maybe um, you could have like a backend controller running on a server. I'm not doing that here in our introductory class. But basically, all you need to do is update the contents in index.cs. So let's go together now and help each other to do that. First of all, I'm going to update your... your I keep losing them. Ah, there we go. I'm not going to talk about how to use Git version control due to reasons of time. If I had another maybe one day of class time, if any of you ladies or guys wants to see Git, let me know. I have materials. I'm just, I'm not going to do Git right now. So anyway, I'm going to drop that in there. Uh, Git is just a way of attaching uh, timeline to your code. So if maybe you're coding, 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 and then you screw something up, it breaks you can revert back to the previous version and, and diff it and see what's happening, but we don't have time for that right now. Anyway, let's keep going. So this part of the lesson is very important as it helps students become familiar with the basic structure of components of the ASP.NET Core project. Very good. So, just program into your brain, it's very important. And let's carry on. Now, part three, building the web app. Designing the front end, create HTML form for calculator. So you guys are familiar with what a form is, right? A form, maybe you're ordering something on Amazon, you enter name, address, credit card number, you have fields and a submit button. That is the traditional mechanism for pushing information from the client web page back up to the server. So we're going to make a form now. So open index.cshtml in the pages folder if you're using Razor or in the view home. So let's go and find index.css. Sorry, index.cshtml. And once again, I'll drop a screenshot because maybe some of our students aren't here today. Maybe they're going to watch the video and, and wrestle with it later on or something. So we'll try and keep everybody together. Right, so that is my page. That is what is showing. I know that that's what's showing because I dropped a little marker message in here, which I'm now seeing rendering. And that is showing right there. And to find that, you go into that directory right there, which is pages. And then it's contained within there. Spend a couple of seconds drilling around in your directory structure. Make sure you're good on all of that stuff. Update our instructions here. So here we're in the pages folder, we're using Razor, which by the way, that is the new technology. I think the reason they have this note here is I suck all this stuff down. The college has an instructor material repository, like GitHub thing where I get my stuff and I customize it. And I think in the old days, maybe to about like, well, this is like maybe six, seven years ago now, pre-version six, it was model view controller. But these days, everything is Razor. In fact, I'm going to remove that reference because I don't think anybody's going to be seeing that anymore. Now, maybe if you're going to an old company, sir, how do we submit this assignment? Yeah, 
So let's talk about how to submit it. Here, good, good point. Maybe I didn't, yeah, I think I talked last week, but maybe I forgot. So let's go and, and thank you for catching me on that. So how to submit this? How to submit this? <laughs> uh, if we were together in class, I would get everybody to set up a GitHub repository. But GitHub, to be honest, I've spent an entire class of four hours just helping every student individually setting up their GitHub. And for some reason, it becomes a black hole of time. So I don't want to go down there. So in terms of zipping the directory, you can if you want. Although, to be honest, you're pretty much just giving me back the code that I've already given you, right? So I would say it's enough. I mean, if you want to zip up your directory, you can. So how to hand this in? So make a Word document. And into the and save that Word document as student name, student ID. And in and I'll give you an upload location, which I don't think I created yet. So I'll make a new one. That sharp symbol, by the way, does not work with file systems. So if you see it looking like this, see with the word sharp spelled out, it's because somebody wants to use it in a file system. And actually, even to use a dot in a file system is not a good idea. So I'm just changing it because I'm now going to make a directory in my Dropbox. Project, C sharp, project, course project. All right, let's just finish this up now. We've got about another 20 minutes roughly, which is okay. So upload your Word file. There. Uh, into this Word file, put the following contents. So I want to see screenshots. And if you don't know how to make a screenshot, send me an email. I'll, I don't want to take class time. But I think everybody knows how to do that. In uh, Mac, you can just press uh, print screen. In Windows, there's the snippet tool. Or if you just go on Google, you're going to find there's like hundreds of good free screenshotting tools out there. So just find a way to make a screenshot and email me. If, if you don't know how to do that, I'll help you out. So what does this Word file put screenshots of your VSC? Because normally the way a project should work is I would walk around and actually watch you doing it, except I can't because you're not here. <laughs> so put screenshots of your Visual Studio, because I'm also giving you all the code as well. So your basic delivery is to make it work, which by the way is a trick, especially if you're on your own yeah, that can be a little bit of work to get it going. So uh, put screenshots of your Visual Studio Code project. Directories. You can copy and paste in all your code because maybe you're going to make some changes to the code to amp it up. I'm not going to insist that you do that because this is already 
a relatively complicated thing for a, you know, you guys are in your second term of C-sharp. You've taken a C-sharp before, of course, but I think you probably have not done web development. So to just even get it up and running, that's good enough for right now. So you can copy and paste your code and maybe you're going to make some additions, right? Maybe you're going to change the CSS to make the screen another background color or something. If you want to see that, if you want me to see that, but copy and paste your code, screenshots of your project directory, as well as screenshots of your working, of your browser showing working, uh, showing that, that it's working, right? Showing working examples of your calculator. I have a friend, the way she um, does it is she makes the students to do a video, a screencast video of themselves as they're doing the project. And I'm not going to do that because to be honest, I like you guys, but I don't like you enough to like sit there for two hours, like watching a two hour video of you typing in Visual Studio code. So just send me some screenshots. That'll be good enough. So anyway, that is your hand in. It's not ideal. The ideal thing would be if you were in the room and I was watching you doing it. However, you're not. So that's the best I can think of here. If you have any questions, email me. I'll help you out then. Now let's carry on. We've got about another 10 minutes roughly. So you, you actually know enough. You could sit by yourself right now and you could just finish the whole thing. But let's do the next little step of it by ourselves. Or sorry, I mean together. All right, so we've seen our basic web page getting served up there. Now, let's make it interactive. Let's put a form so user can enter, uh, put in some numbers, and then they can have an operation like add, subtract, multiply, divide. If we had another three or four weeks of class, the next thing we would do after this is we'd set up a database and we'd set it so user can type something in a form field and click search. And then the code would go into, um, would do a search on the database and pull it and display it back out. That, for example, is how Travelocity or these uh, travel you know, arrangement websites work. Could we show our running app in the next class? Yeah. Well, the problem is next class is the test only. I would love to see it, Iqbar. I would love to see your work, but next class is only is final exam only. However, if you really want to show me your work by a video, I would love to see it. So here's how you can show me if you want to make a video. It's not hard. It just takes a couple of minutes. I will put the instructions right here. So if you do want, and this is optional, you don't have to, but if you you know want to show off your good work, or maybe if you want to make a video and upload it to YouTube and then put the link to the YouTube video in your resume to show your employers your great work, right? We encourage students to do that. So if you want to make a video such as the one, oh, actually that was made with AI. <laughs> if you want, and this is optional, if you want to make a video to showcase your work, very optional, but definitely if you want to do it, go for it. your LinkedIn profile or resume for employers to see it, do the following. Go to, and I'm doing this quickly, and you're very welcome to be in touch with me for more help later on. Go to techsmith.com. And then go to um, products, Camtasia, free trial. Products, Camtasia, free trial. 
Camtasia is the video tool I use. Download Camtasia. And if you're going to do that, I have another video that tells you how to make a Camtasia video. We do that for the capstone project course. I don't have time to demonstrate it now, but if you want it, Iqbar or anybody else, it is yours for the asking as soon as you ask about it. Having said that, it is super simple. There's a ton of good stuff out there. In fact, you can search for, right? So download, so in TechSmith, go to products, Camtasia free trial, 30 day trial. We do the capstone, my capstone project class, I'm going to after it. That's what they're doing today. They're showing me their videos they made with this stuff. And then if you want help using Camtasia, email me or my friend on YouTube, Lon Naylor, nice guy. I've worked with him for many years. Search on YouTube. Or Lon Naylor, that's the man's name. And he is a coach. That's how he makes his living. He is a coach and a trainer for Camtasia. And he does custom coaching, which I'm a coaching client of him, by the way. But uh, he also has a ton of free stuff. You know, how to make your first screencast Camtasia video. He has like at least 14 videos with that title. Watch his stuff. And if you still need help, then just ask me. And then you can export, so you can do a screencast, as you probably, I've kicked some of my screencast videos out to you. Do a screencast video of your own screen. Running, you can even go through your code and you can narrate and talk to me about what you did. If you want, you can show and narrate your code. Just talk into the mic and it'll record. And then you can you can screen, you can demonstrate, you can screencast your app working. And then you can save and export up to YouTube. You can make it private if you don't want anybody else to see. However, I would suggest making it public because why wouldn't you want employers to see your good work? Plus, there's millions of people making content on YouTube. Nobody, if you're shy and nervous, believe me, nobody's going to watch your video anyway because there's so much other competition of people who are spending advertising dollars to get attention. Uh, export up to YouTube and send me the link. In your Word file. So, Iqbal, that's how you can do it. So, Iqbar, I'm going to look forward to it, right? I, I'm always very happy. I love to see my students work. So Camtasia, once you install it, basically looks like this. Camtasia. Oh, I thought I had just updated to 2024. I guess I haven't done that yet. Anyway. So then you're going to go new project. Record. And I'm going to turn my cam off here so I can use it over here. So now I'm doing a screencast. Now I'm recording my screen in a couple of seconds. So now I'm going to capture my camera. There I am, my mic. And my system audio, my screen is going to be full screen. So now, Iqbar, you're going to go record. And now everything I do here is going to be captured into this 
video. So I could go through my uh, project. I could show my code. I could go to my Visual Studio code. I could talk about what it's doing. I could talk about the directory structure. I could go to my browser, which I, I, I haven't done this yet. Maybe you guys have already jumped ahead and copied that code in. Yes, I'm on port 5021, I forgot. By the way, that's a hyperlink. I could click there and it would open it there for me as well. 5021. Whoops, host colon 5021. So that's how you would do it. And then you would go and get your real actual implemented code. Now, Iqbar, once you've done that, once you've made it, you're gonna stop so you're going to say stop the video making. And if there's any sort of messy stuff or something that, you know, like you were, I don't know, sneezing or something like that, you can go and edit it out. For example, I had a couple of seconds of silence while I was groping around looking for my port. So I can see my audio track right there. See, so there was a little bit of silence there or anything you want to sort of edit out. You can put your scrub head there. You can, you can pan over that. You can right click and say ripple delete. You can do whatever you want, right? You can play with it. There's like another silent patch I'm going to get rid of. Another way you could do that is by typing the S on the keyboard, which is like, you know, or you can say split all. And then go to the end of the part you want to clip out and say split all. And then you can ripple delete. And also wherever you have a, um, a sort of a disconnect, wherever you've made a split, you can also put transitions in, which are kind of fun. I mean, this stuff is very engaging, right? You can spend... <laughs> quite a lot of time. It can become quite an absorbingly interesting thing to do. So once again, I'm not going to spend too much time here beyond just pointing out this is all stuff you can do. And then once you're finished with that, go through my uh, project. I could show. So Iqbar, here's the last thing you're going to do. Export. You can kick it up to YouTube. And I will actually show you when this is ready, and it'll probably take 20 minutes or so, probably not till after class, but demo of presenting your project using Camtasia, using a Camtasia screencast. Project using a Camtasia screencast. And in a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes or something, It'll present me with my YouTube video. All right, very good, guys. So thank you so much for the question. Um, I think at this point, we're probably going to draw our class to a close. All you need to do to make the project work is go through your instructions. I think we got as far as here. Oh, yeah, that's just something we were talking about doing. So we were just right to there. So replace the existing content with this. Right, so find your index.cshtml. Copy this whole thing. Make sure you get it all right from the top, right down to the bottom. Copy. So follow the instructions. Add HTML to the calculator form. Replace the existing content 
with the following HTML. So starting from at page down to close div. So go to your Visual Studio code. Find your index.cs, right? So there it is. Now you see here, I have nothing up here. I'm gonna delete the blank lines. So it's asking me to replace from at page down to the close of the div. So it basically wants me to replace the whole page. So I'll say back, uh, back thing to delete, backspace to delete, paste. And that should be all you need to do, I guess. Make sure you save, please. Save. And that should be pretty much it for your project, I think. <laughs> oh, actually, no. Well, no, because what we have not done yet, actually, we've only done the front end. We have made the web page, but there's still nothing behind it to do the arithmetic. Now, because it's your project and you need to do a little bit of work for your own project, all you need to do is find this, right? So go back to your index CS HTML because we're doing it all in there. So open that and paste that code in. And we're not doing this, by the way. We're not doing the, uh, we are not doing this way of doing it. We are using Razor Pages, Razor Pages web design architecture, not the old school model view controller. So just totally ignore this section, don't you? I'm going to leave it there because. You might get a job at a company and as a new hire, they're going to put you on the support team supporting the older version of product. So it's probably not a bad idea to read it, know about it, but we're not doing it here. So we're not even doing any of that. So once you've done that, so here's basically what you need to do. This is what you need to do to finish your project. You need to do this step because we did the rest of it together. So you do this. using exactly the procedures. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna turn off my um, recording from this meeting because it takes a couple of minutes to assemble. So I'm gonna give it some time.